Hello, and welcome to Wacker Noise and Tech Talks. I'm your host and technical training manager, Jake Gaylord. Today I've got Luke Sevcik with me, who is a uh, sales and application engineering trainer um, specializing in concrete products. Good morning, Luke. Good morning. So Luke, it's my understanding that concrete trowels are much like a guitar. If they're not tuned properly, we're not going to get the results that we're looking for. Is that correct? That's correct. These are big machines, and they're usually used on some pretty big jobs. So to have a machine go down during the course of the process of using it is a big deal. Okay. So what different types of trowels um, can we talk about? I mean, obviously we've got a ride-on trowel here. What other types are there, Luke? A walk-behind trowels range anywhere from a 24-inch to a 36-inch to a 48-inch machine. For ride-on trowels, we'll have anywhere from a 36-inch to a 48-inch up to a big 60-inch machine. Okay. So I assume those are for larger flat work jobs, um, Walmart stores, for example, correct? Yes, yes. Typically, if you look at how a machine takes the place of a different finisher, a walk-behind machine will take the place of, say, three to four hand finishers versus a ride-on machine will take the place of three to four walk-behind machines. So with riding trowels, what different types do we have? Are we talking different fuel systems? What, can you explain a little bit more about that? Certainly. Please? So with ride-on trowels, you've got various mechanisms that we can steer or operate the machine. This is called a mechanical steer machine, where you've got joystick control that go right down to what's called a gearbox, which makes the machine go forward, backward, left, right, turn, and so on and so forth. Um, we also have various fuel types that we can use. You have a gasoline-powered unit, you have a diesel-powered unit, and like this machine here, this is a propane hybrid unit that you can either run propane or gasoline. Now, Luke, if we're running a propane system, do we still have to have proper ventilation? Does the machine still create the same exhaust fumes as a gasoline or diesel engine? Well, it's, it's a common misconception that propane is a clean burning source. It's cleaner than gasoline engines, but it still puts out carbon monoxide, so the air still needs to be monitored for safety. So, Luke, going back to fine-tuning this machine, can you walk us through what, what would be done on a daily basis with a machine like this? Certainly. Prior to this machine going out on a rental or even on a daily use for the contractor, there are the simple things that you'd probably do with most vehicles on, an, on a weekly basis you'd want to do on a daily basis. One of those would be checking the fuel tank to make sure that there's the proper fuel and the right amount of fuel in it because you want to run out halfway through the job. We also have what's called a water tank, which is a common misconception because finishers will not put water in these tanks, but will use some type of finishing aid um, or evaporation retardant that will go in the tank. Uh, other things we want to do is we want to check the air filter. Construction sites are a very dusty, dirty environment. Absolutely. And these machines need to stay clean and needs to have clean air to breathe, just like we do, in order for it to operate properly and not overheat and so on and so forth. Uh, other things would be checking the oil, making sure that all the lubrication points are greased also. Okay. So that buttons up the, the daily maintenance checks. How about on a weekly um, duration loop? Weekly, if these machines get used a lot, there's a couple components you want to check. One primarily will be the blades. You want to look for wear, any type of damage to it. The spider arms, which are the arms that actually hold the blades in place. Check the gearbox, check for any types of leaks that would be on either from the engine or from the gearbox itself. So Luke, you had mentioned obviously the importance of the condition of the blades themselves. If I, if I should happen to find one that um, is worn uh, above and beyond that of the others, can I replace one blade on this machine? Well, just like in an all-wheel drive car, where if you have one wheel go bad, you need to replace all four, same thing applies to a trowel. If you got one bad blade, you need to replace all the blades, whether it's going to be a 4 series, 5 series, or 6 series blade rotor. The reason being is that you're going to have one blade that's going to finish differently than the other, and it's going to lead what's called blade chatter on the floor, which is almost impossible to finish out because you're going to constantly be going over the same spot each and every time. Okay. So what constitutes a, a properly worn blade? What, what's a new blade look like versus an old one? How do, how do I understand that, Luke? Well, new blades, and this is, a, this is not an industry standard, but typically you're going to get about 50,000 square feet per blade out of these things. Okay. And a new blade is going to have the same consistent thickness throughout, and as these blades get used, they're going to wear themselves thinner and thinner and thinner, almost to like a knife's edge. Across the entire surface of yes. the blade. Okay. Yes, for common use. So a blade that is well worn, as you can see, this isn't wearing um, evenly throughout the blade. 
and you've got a tattered edge that you can actually flex and pull pieces off of. So now this is going to leave a poor finish versus having a blade that's going to be worn evenly throughout the entire edge of the profile. Okay, so what are the things that we need to look at on these machines from a monthly basis? Monthly, the same thing. I would definitely look at blade wear on them. Um, blades, I could tell you that blades are going to have a life of 50,000 square feet. Okay. Um, finished blades will have about twice that because we can turn them around. However, we still need to keep an eye on those blades, even if they're used 10,000 square feet or not. Some surfaces are harder than others and will wear the blades faster. So on an, on an annual basis, obviously, again, we can always refer to the operator's manual for the manufacturer's recommendations. What, uh, what do you as an expert recommend on an annual perspective from a maintenance side? Annually, I would be definitely looking at changing out the, the fluid or the gearbox oil. Okay. Um, spider arms should all be pulled off, cleaned, and reset and adjusted. Uh, the drive belt for the belt system, if it's a belt-driven system, should always be either checked or replaced. Okay. So, Luke, I, I understand, obviously, a lot of the machines now are becoming more efficient. They're going to EFI fuel injection systems. What about the older machines that have carburetors uh, in that type of induction system? Where, where, where do we need to look at uh, maintenance items for that? Absolutely. So what we need to find is that there's a, a cable that runs all the way to the carburetor. If we don't lube or at least check that cable, especially in winter environments when a little bit of moisture is involved, these things can get rusty and sticky. So we want to make sure that we're lubing those, whether it's going to be on a ride-on trowel or some type of walk-behind machine, which is always going to be a cable throttle. Okay, great. So prior to a rental or use on a job, what are the things that we need to prep this machine for? Well, prior to rental, we always want to make sure that the machine itself is clean. The machine's not clean. It's got hard chunks of concrete stuck to it. Those hard chunks may fall off. In the finishing process, that chunk may be detrimental to the floor. It gets underneath a blade, the blade rotates this hard chunk of concrete, and it scratches the floor. That's almost impossible to fix. Other things we want to look at then is we want to coat this machine with some type of release agent. A lot of release agents out there are water soluble and non-staining. And especially we want to pay attention to the lower unit, which would be the frame, the tops of the spider arms, the tops of the blades, and make sure that all of our caps are on top of our zerk fittings. And we want to especially pay attention to covering up the bolt heads. Now, Luke, you had mentioned that many contractors will use a finishing agent in the water system on these machines. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. A finishing agent is a water additive. So typically, they won't have just water in the tank because if you add water to the surface of concrete, you actually weaken it. So this actually acts as like um, an evaporation retardant to lock the moisture into the concrete. So if you've got uh, light coming through a window or if there's a door opening or something like that, the finishers will come up and spray through the retardant system onto the slab. So the material that they want to put in here, they mix with water. Uh, this will be a water-soluble, non-staining, and environmentally friendly uh, component that they add to the water. However, sometimes if the material sits too long inside the tank, it can settle out to the bottom and it can clog the nozzles. There's a sediment bowl or a screen on the side of the trowel underneath where the tank is located that you can simply unscrew that and then drain the material out and then flush it out of the system. So that brings up a good question, Luke. It's, it's 5.30 in the morning. I've got this trowel on, uh, on the back of my work truck. I'm going to be heading to a job. I haven't had my coffee yet. I pull the cap off the water tank and I threw a gallon of diesel fuel into it. How much trouble am I in? Do I need to tell the boss what happened or can I, can I fix that situation? No worries. As long as you got a place to dispose of the diesel fuel, it takes less than 10 minutes to be able to drain this tank out, flush it out, and you're back on the road again. All right, Luke, now that you walked us through maintenance, um, pre-operation setup and preparations that we need to make to the machine, um, putting a finishing agent in with the water system, We've gone, we've done our pour, we've, we've finished that slab, we had great results based on tuning this machine properly. What steps do we need to take after that operation is complete? So, even though we did apply some type of release agent to the machine, we still want to make sure that when the machine is fully cooled, we can take a pressure washer to it and pay attention to the lower unit of the machine, making sure we get all that excess concrete off. So, overall, using our release agent, pressure washing, pay paying special attention to the lower unit, spider arms, trowel pans, um, cleaning the water system out of any of the sediment that may have uh, 
may have formed from the finishing agent, that's essentially wraps up our post-operation checking. Is that correct? Yes, I would say so, yes. Well, Luke, I appreciate you giving us our, your expert opinion in terms of and recommendations of how to use this machine, how to prep it for a job, and how to clean up afterwards. For more information on Wacker Neusen products, please visit wackerneusen.com. For exclusive information and texts pertaining to training, please join our text club by simply sending the word WN Training to 31996. I'm Jake Gaylord, your technical training manager and Wacker Noyce and All It Takes host saying goodbye for now. Hey.